Morning, everybody. Vinman's Bakery in beautiful downtown Ellensburg. You've got to love it. Welcome here in Ellensburg on a chilly morning. The local time is 8.49, and we will begin our program called Baja BC Fault question mark with Bob Miller at the top of the hour at 9 o'clock. That's about 11 minutes from now. I'm so glad that we have so many on a Sunday morning joining us. There's, what, 273 watching at the moment? And that number just bumped up to 300 and so on. So that's delightful, and it's so great to have you all with us. This is a special Sunday morning show, and I've been at this for a while, uh, and many are not keeping up. And I don't blame you. There's a lot going on, and I'm doing three of these a week. Uh, but the schedule will slow, as we'll talk about once we begin. Uh, I see some five-by-fives, and that's wonderful. And uh, let me say hi to a few folks, and then I'll email our guest, Bob Miller, say hi to a few more, and then we'll begin the program in about 10 minutes or, no, uh, or so. Uh, Steve's in Texas. Good morning. Squaw Valley, California, Orem, Utah, Winnipeg, Canada, uh, Kamaya, Idaho. I'm seeing some new places here. That's kind of fun. Uh, Ottawa, Canada, Lake Orion, Michigan. Scrolling back now just a little bit. Oh, there's Saber. Saber, you dirty dog. You're in Baja right now. Saber is in Baja, California, Mexico, uh, living the good life down there on a beach somewhere, I presume. Saber, you got some decent Wi-Fi. That's wonderful to see. Thank you. Bonus points for you. Scroll it down to live. Austin, Texas, the Malaga Slide. That's Sharon. Boise, Idaho. Harwinton, Connecticut. Hello, Ernst. Pemberville, Ohio. Uh, Abdulaziz is in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Hello. How are you today? Thank you for joining us. Chinook, Washington, Sudbury, Ontario, Canada, Tualatin, Oregon. Michael and family is in Trim, Ireland, North Dakota, Squim, Washington, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, Hollister, California, Newport, Oregon, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Murfreesboro, Murfreesboro, Oh, boy. Mike, I'm sorry. Murfreesboro. Murfreesboro? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Uh, Myra's in Quinnell up there in uh, B.C. Hello. Uh, Bergen, Norway, Southwest Virginia, Omaha, Nebraska, Tanana Terrain, Fairbanks, Alaska, uh, Somerset, uh, U.K., and so on. So you're not kidding. I'm five by five. That's good. Kirk and Philomath, um, the mug maker. The World Cup is tied. Wait a minute. I, I thought it was just 2-0. I just checked before I came down here. France has scored two goals in the last five minutes or something? Are you kidding? Uh, stay off of current events. Okay. Emailing the guest. Add the guest. Copy the link. Paste into Bob Miller's email. Get rid of the freaking... Convert to plain link. That's what I need. Gmail and away that goes. So I am five by five. I'm seeing two by two. That bothers me. Oh, I see. Okay. Two, two, two is the score. Wow. Okay. Well, I don't blame you if you're a if you're a football fan, soccer fan, and you want to break away from us, if there really have been two. It's two to two. Wow. All right. Can't focus on that. Got to focus on what we're doing here today. Hello to a few more of you. Uh, San Jose, California. Palantine, Illinois. Thomas is in Seattle. Uh, Oscar loves the whale. Well, there's more coming on the whale. Uh, Madras, Oregon. Thank you. Uh, uh, Virginia, Minnesota. Kansas City, Missouri, Rochester, New York. It's Monday in Australia. 
Carlton, Oregon, Rockland, California. Yeah, I'm going to ignore the, the, the football thing now. Uh, Stefano from Italy. Kirk is in Sweden. Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I'm ignoring the Seahawks as well. Okay, I'm just trying to focus on the geology. I can't be thinking about other things. I'm so glad that you're all here. Uh, 425 now watching. McKinney, Texas. Cleveland, Ohio. Middleburg. The Netherlands. Silverthorne, Colorado. Farmington, New Mexico. Chicago, Illinois. There is no N in Palatine, Illinois. Thank you, Edith. Uh, Buckeye, Arizona. Garrett, the Dutch night owl from the Netherlands. Norley's back, as many of you know. Margie was awesome, I agree. Kieser, Oregon. Richland, Washington. Uh, San Jose State. Michelle, are you an, an alum? Uh, Greenwich, uh, Connecticut. Overthrust. Pine Mountain, oh, oh. Herschel's from the Pine Mountain Overthrust in Kentucky. There's backcountry Lindsay. Hello. Um, <laughs> yeah. Robert says it's ADHD morning. <laughs> yeah, looked at the live chat right now. That, that seems to be about right. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, let me... Uh, don't see Bob in the green room yet. I won't be concerned uh, for another couple minutes. We've got about five minutes or so. It's cold in Zion National Park. Jeffrey, you keep watching from Zion. Do you work in Zion Park? Are you a ranger? Or are you just kind of hanging out there in the parking lot or something? There's Todd, geologically speaking. Yeah, let me show you. Um, so not only was a whale delivered to the house yesterday by Jeff from Vinman's Bakery, but also plenty of goodies straight from the bakery. These are my favorites in particular, the cherry danishes. We have some croissants, that's French, uh-oh. Uh, you can see as well as I. So, yeah. Uh, I might as well read it to you now. Hey, there's Bobby's in the green room. Hi, Bob. I'm glad you're with us. Thank you. Um, yeah, so many of you, I assume, saw the show yesterday. So, got an email from Jeff at Vinman's Bakery. And he said, just as I was finishing yesterday, he said... Uh, Hey, Ahab, will you be home in the next hour? I've got whales in the oven. So Jeff was inspired from our talk yesterday of sinistral and dextral and whale going up and down, migrating, that he, he created a whale for us. And but while I'm at it, I also got a text from Backcountry Gary. said, hey, Nick, thanks for the uh, pitch for the calendars. Over 70 calendar sales so far just today. A bunch of U.S. states, Australia, Germany, U.K., Canada. Uh, okay, so, so um, yeah, you guys are enthusiastic. What can I say? Okay, the guest is in the green room. Um, I, I'm going with the, the kind of question approach like I did yesterday with Margie. We'll see if Bob likes it or not. I guess, you know, this could be a first. Bob could just say, uh, yeah, I don't think I'm interested in this and just removes himself from the green room and that's it. Um, hopefully not, though. Um, yeah, we got more than 500 watching. Let's say hi to a few more. Double checking one more time. I'm trying a different. Did I have the crackling mic at the beginning? I mean, I had my cute little entrance, but, uh, well, I, I can watch the replay. Forget it. Um, yeah, joy giver couple more hellos to where you are viewing from and then we will uh, begin our program I need to start uh, need to start thinking real carefully about what we're doing particularly loose this morning as you will see uh, Joe slick live hello Bothell Washington 
reports about the audio. Thank you. Uh, 66KBM is from the Netherlands and Robertson, Illinois, Milwaukee, Oregon, Sonora, California, Columbia, Missouri, Houston, Texas, Auburn, Washington, Wausau, Wisconsin. That's the Rib Mountain Pluton. Lake Chelan, Washington, Marysville, Washington. Uh, Lucy is listening from Durango, Mexico, land of gold. Thank you, Lucy. Ava is in Sacramento, uh, Calgary, Alberta, West Virginia, Carefree. Leslie's near Boston. Okay, all is right with the world. Okay, well, Bob's there. Uh, Bob, I'm thinking a half an hour or so, something like that, and uh, of chalkboard, in other words. And I, I've got one minute. I need to co start concentrating on the show today. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, hope you enjoy this morning. Hot mic. All right. You got a food prop. How are you going to use it? When are you going to use it? Your chalkboards are mostly leftovers from yesterday. You're still trying to process yesterday. Right? So let's use yesterday a fair amount. Bob and Margie are friends. Bob and Margie have a long history together. Lean into that. Use that. What is your order on the chalkboard? Maybe in the order of the questions on the first chalkboard. Maybe that's what you do. You got a little bit of Nanaimo. You're going to use Mappy today. You're going to use the laptop maps more than normal. Go to the laptop earlier. You don't have to go on the chalkboard. Go to, yeah, you got good maps on the, on the laptop. Use, use that laptop today more. Go earlier to the laptop. Keep it fast. Keep it fast. You can always go back to the laptop after you visit with Bob. You really don't have a plan, do you? All right. Well, it always seems to work somehow. Oh yeah, you got the back of this. Yeah, you got the back of this. Don't forget about this. This is this is not bad. The back of this green chalkboard, right? Don't forget about those two backs. Those are pretty good. Okay. All sorts of props. Are you ready? Are you ready? A pleasant good morning to you all. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA, on a very dark winter morning. The building is empty. The building is cold. Margie Rusmore, our guest yesterday, mentioned that her office was cold. Uh, I guess that's a thing now. Universities just like turning off the heat, basically, or lowering it way down to save on heating costs. So it's I almost see my breath in the hallways out here. Makes sense, I guess. Who else would be here working except for those of us that are really into this? And it's my decision to keep working on this stuff because I'm going to take a two-week break, and I wanted to get to halfway through the alphabet. So uh, right away, let's make sure that you know that uh, there are no more Sunday shows. It's, more, it's Sunday morning, December 18th. There are no more Sunday shows the rest of the series. There's no more su Sunday shows the rest of the series. It's going to be Wednesday and Saturdays for the rest of the alphabet. So this is the last of these bonus Sunday shows. So please come back, if you like, Wednesday, December 21st, if you're not too busy, at 2 p.m. Pacific, and we'll have Stacia Gordon and, and uh, Kirsten Sauer uh, that will finish out the first half of the alphabet with us. That's session L. And then we'll take two weeks off for Christmas time, uh, holiday time, and then Basil Tickoff will be session M, and Bernie Hausen will be session N, and we'll just ride that all the way through to mid-February to the rest of the alphabet. So the, uh, the paleomagnetism, wow, can't even say it, uh, is coming uh, in January. And uh, we'll see how, how well we're able to uh, um, operate with that. I'm stumbling because I'm already thinking about all that. How am I going to do that? How am I going to do all that paleomag? Don't think about it till then. Okay, great. 
But we know that we're interested in the paleo mag. It keeps coming up, and it might come up again today with Bob Miller. I want to ask these questions to Bob in some sort of order. I'm not really sure. And we'll see what he's enthusiastic about talking about. And maybe he'll just pass on a couple of these, and that's totally fine. And I feel like freelancing right off the bat. Bob Miller, many of you know by now, he's part of this thing called the Dream Team. That's what that's a moniker that I came up with. A research grant in the North Cascades of Washington. That's right, we're in Washington. Uh, we're not up in BC today. We're in Washington. We're in rocks that I've been learning about carefully with the Dream Team and others. I've been out this past summer just making videos on my own and hiking with Bob Miller and then hooking up with Bob Miller and Stacia Gordon on the North Cascades Highway. Yeah, that's the guy if you've seen some of those videos. So to be totally honest, all of this, all of this exotic terrain stuff for the last three years was motivated by being part of this research team a small part, but a part of this North Cascades research team. And so we're just kind of, after all this kind of wildness, especially yesterday with Margie Rushmore, which I thoroughly enjoyed, and hopefully you did too. I don't know, we might be kind of reeling, in, reeling it in a little bit today. You know, that's it. reeling it in with Bob Miller. Maybe, maybe that's what it is today. I don't know. But we're getting a little closer to home, and I have questions that you can see on the chalkboard. We've spent the last two shows talking about the Coast Plutonic Complex up in British Columbia. Can we take that CPC, bring it down across the border, and realize that the North Cascades of Washington are the same damn thing? Yes or no? Seemed like Margie was hesitant about it. From reading the papers that we have today, I'm guessing that Bob is more enthusiastic about that, but we'll let him speak for himself. If we like the North Cascades being part of the CPC, then can we take the North Cascades and think of it as entirely within the insular block? I think Bob's going to push back on that. Again, I'm just tossing it out there. We've been working on it uh, for the first half of the alphabet. Can we put that Baja BC fault, if it exists, off to the west, no, off to the east, and have everything in the North Cascades be part of the insular block? And you remember Margie was not as enthusiastic about just calling things insular or intermontane. Can we come up with a different framework or a different paradigm for the discussion? Paleo mag or something else. Again, we'll, we'll, we'll just kind of play with it a little bit today. But I'm curious if we take this concept of having everything in the North Cascades, the plutons, the thrust faults, the metasedimentary rock and everything else, as part of this block that did major amounts of translation to the north, Then we're starting to think that maybe the crystalline core, which has been the main focal point of Bob Miller and team, has done this crazy trip from the south. I'm slowing down because it's just, even just saying it out loud, like I hadn't really carefully thought about that to this point, even though you think I would because of Mount Stewart being the centerpiece of the whole discussion. And that's part of the crystalline core. But we'll see what problems I have from getting that far along. And then if we feel perky about it, there's all this beautiful green rock, this serpentinite rock. And Bob is particularly fond of the Ingalls serpentinite, which is just north of Valensburg. He did his PhD. Our guest today did his PhD on the Ingalls ophiolite, which now has a rather specific date of 162 million years old. This is also a green rock that's from the Oregon beach, the Oregon coast. So I wasn't planning on using this until I just noticed this uh, in my office from Colin and Gail Garvey from Medford, Oregon. They wrote a nice card just a few weeks ago. And they said, we've got this cottage down here near Port Orford, Oregon, where there's occasional outcrops of serpentinite that erodes along the Oregon beaches, enclosed as a small sample. If you ever want to come down to Southern Oregon, I'd be happy to have you. So the idea is, I want to play with it. Can we take the Ingalls Ophiolite of Central Washington and make a case that the Josephine Ophiolite on the southern Oregon coast 
Is that the same 162 million year old ophiolite, which is ocean floor rock? And if it is, what does that mean? I thought the Klamaths were intermontane. But I thought the crystalline core was insular. So, like, are there major regional ramifications by simply taking two rocks that appear to be identical, 162 million year old green rock in central Washington and southwestern Oregon? Does that help us or hurt us or do nothing for us for these kind of regional discussions? All right. Pick it up, boy. Pick it up. What am I want to do? So I just want to show you some chalkboards, just getting some things out. So I'm just throwing some things out for Bob, uh, who might want to just sit and uh, and think about what he wants to do. Well, sure, let's do it. So from yesterday, I was sharing a brand new thought, and technically it wasn't a brand new thought. Basil Tickoff brought it up, and many I saw not I noticed in the live chat from yesterday, many of you remember, well, Basil was talking about that last, last winter. That it appears that there's major southward motion of some sort of ocean plate scene, southward motion, offshore or part of North America's coast, older than 100 million years ago, when you hammered that yesterday with the idea of a sinistral offset, a left lateral offset, older than 100. And then apparently, on a very gross regional scale, younger than 100 million years ago, we start going north. Well, Jeff from Vinman's Bakery was inspired by that session yesterday. And he made a beautiful whale. That ain't no whale. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. That's a whale. The huge goldfish. That's a whale. Thank you, Jeff at Vindman's Bakery. Or Nick the Baker, or both of you guys. And so the idea is, do we have a whale? I don't know. Do I have a whale swimming south older than 100 million years ago? And then, what, 100 million years ago, which is the main hit, that's the big insular collision with the western margin of North America, according to Basil and others. Do we then get the whale to start swimming back north? And we've had nothing but right lateral offsets since 100 million years ago. I have permission to do this from Jeff, by the way. So Jeff says, hey, wasn't Margie talking about Maybe it's not just the whale that's just you know, beautifully swimming passively up the margin. Weren't we having North America hit the whale? And aren't we taking the piece of whale and rotate it? Having blocks of the whale move northward, but the whale fragments are moving north? And can't we have some, some folding and thrust faulting within the whale itself? I don't think we have an intact whale. You know, like, that's such a shame. He spent so much time on the whale. Bring in the snot whale. Okay, that's enough fun and games. Let's get to something real. The Klamaths are going to come up today, I think, with Bob. And this is Mount Stewart. And this is similar granodiorite, or a range of 96 to 91 million year old plutons on the other side of this fault. This is known as the Straight Creek Fault, or Fraser River Fault. And I feel like some of this I can kind of gloss over because I have been hammering these concepts for the last couple of, of winters. So I know at the beginning I didn't assume that you'd see prior alphabet series, but I don't know, I think I do need to kind of push it along a little bit. So today, one of the things Bob is doing for us is talking about individual strike-slip faults that do exist, and each of them do have documented right lateral or dextral offset, meaning that we are definitely younger than 100 million years ago, and those strike-slip faults have been offset by an even younger strike-slip fault, also with right lateral offset. You can see how complicated this can get in a hurry. And it's important to address because this is the CPC up here. 
And so if we restore this Straight Creek Fault in north central Washington, which comes right down to eastern Washington, very close to my town here in Ellensburg, suddenly the Coast Mountains Belt, or the CPC, is not that far away. If we simply just restore this younger than 50 million year old uh, Straight Creek Fault. Okay? It's going away. Oh, we got pieces of whale. I'm stepping on pieces of whale all over the place. That was fun, Jeff. Thank you. Yet again, I'm coming here. So let me clarify. Uh, mostly inspired by Margie's comments yesterday, but inspired by others as well, going all the way back to Merle Beck, who made a surprise appearance, by the way. Merle Beck suddenly popped up in the live chat. Did you notice yesterday? So Merle, you figured out how to get in that live chat yesterday. Maybe you're watching again right now. Hope everything's going well and your recovery is going well, Merle. Hang in there. All right. So back to Merle even. Merle's like, you know, the Baja BC concept was coined by Ted Irving. We're just playing with it back in the 1980s. And Daryl Cowan in the mid-1990s came up with those classic diagrams that I've been using. And I've been framing our discussion involving one major Baja BC fault. You've seen this a million times by now. But I want to be careful and not push Bob Miller in this episode today. And I'm not going to push you for tuning into an episode titled Baja BC Fault, question mark. I'm not sure we are looking for one major fault. Especially after today's show when we see we have a number of faults with smaller amounts of offset. I ran out of chalkboard space, so let me just show you my notes that Bijou and I drew this morning. Instead of simply one big B Baja BC block with more than 3,000 kilometers of offset, which Mahoney called a phantom fault, okay. What if we start thinking about this? And some of you in the live chat have been pushing for this for a few shows now. Why does it have to be one big fault? Why can't it be, I don't know, a dozen or more smaller strike-slip faults? And if you can start working with each of those individual strike-slip faults, all with dextral or right lateral offset, and if these, I'm just making up numbers now, but what if that strike-slip fault has 715 kilometers of offset? What if that one has 225? What if that one has 1,000? Can we add up those offset values in kilometers? Can we use piercing points on those individual smaller scale strike slip faults? And can we, can we approach 3,000 kilometers? One of the papers today is saying we're not getting close to 3,000, but we're getting closer than, than, uh, than previously thought. I don't know. This is almost cheating now, but I'm just showing my notes more than drawing things out on the chalkboard. So there is the Straight Creek Fault. There is Mount Stewart MS and the spasm pluton in BC, which has been shown quite convincingly that it's the same stuff. And the Chewakam schist is the same stuff as the settler schist up in BC, and so on. So that's Bob kind of giving us a sense of that. Okay, what else do I have on the chalkboard? Well, I'm just reinforcing that. I didn't erase a thing yet from yesterday. Up until yesterday's show, we had just one major Baja BC fault that we wondered about its location and its significance. For all I know, Bob wants to double down and say, no, I think there is a major Baja BC fault, and it's, and it's the Pesaten fault, or it's the Ross Lake. Maybe he will say that. We'll see. But I think my instincts are to think about a bunch, maybe each of these is a fault that has a significant amount of offset, including all the way back to the east, which is the more east you go, the more radical I think you'll get with looking for these major offsets. Okay, leave it alone. Uh, this is another approach to the same series of questions. I kind of like it. It introduces a couple of new concepts. Still just kind of throwing out random things that Bob may or may not want to talk with, uh, work with. This is from yesterday. Let's get in there closer. This is from yesterday and the last two shows, actually. And you remember that there were four distinctly different magmatic flare-ups in the Coast Mountains Baffle, Robinson and Mark. 
and they had well developed one, two, three, four. The magmas are uh, migrating inland as they get younger. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. We've done it a couple of times. I don't need to explain again. Adding this idea of changing from sinistral to dextral along the entire western margin of North America, kind of interesting, but I don't know if it really helps us or hurts us. But that's in pink, the CPC. Now, here's that Straight Creek Fault. And we want to come to Bob in a few minutes and ask, are we comfortable jumping across that Fraser River Fault in Canada and continuing to find the same kinds of rocks, the same kind of thrust faults, the same kind of plutons? I think the answer is yes. I don't know how to put it. I want to answer for Bob. I think Bob's been saying that for quite some time, and he has been going back and forth across the border. But here's what's new to me this morning that might be interesting to you. These should look familiar from last winter, if you were with us. Last, last January and February, we were heavy into the magmatic flare-ups in the North Cascades of Washington. And the Dream Team's been working with them very, very carefully. 96 to 87. 50 to 45. Those were the two major magmatic flare-ups in the North Cascades. And who better to talk to than Bob Miller about those? And there was a less dominant and more puzzling, I guess, magmatic flare-up between 78 and 60. Well, what do you notice? First of all, these numbers don't uh, merge nicely between North Cascades and CPC, so that's a vote against connecting these things, right? And then I still remember Chris Mattinson, who has an office upstairs, and he'll be a guest in next, uh, next month. Chris Mattinson said, yeah, I saw those magmatic shows you had for the North Cascades. Good job. I really enjoyed that. I learned a lot. You know, there are some magmas in the North Cascades that are older than 100 million years old. And I'm like, oh, you're rocks. Yeah, I forgot. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassed. So in the Chelan Migmatite and the neighboring Okanagan Range Batholith, Chris Mattinson and a few others, Aaron Shea, have some dates going back almost 200 million years ago, older than the oldest plutons up in Canada. What's up with here? Is this the wild card or the um, enigma of this whole scene? Can we do something with those flare-ups that are far older than everything else in the North Cascade? I don't know. I can't hold it. I got to say, it. you know, that we're going to have Karin Siglock on again this coming January, next month. I'm excited for that again. And she and Mitch Mahalanek have been talking about this concept of westward subduction to create magmas older than 100 million years ago out in the water. I'll have to check with Karin, but I, I think she switches from westward subduction to eastward subduction at 100 million years ago. In other words, after that insular gets slammed into by a moving North American plate, I think the polarity of the subduction zone changes, but what do I know? Okay. Um, almost done before I go to the laptop, Bob. I think I'm done there. I'm including this. I didn't erase anything. I'm just including this because... I don't know if you're, are you very into this? Can you pick out what I added this morning? Everything else is identical. This is the Calgary group mostly from the Nanaimo sediments between 90 and 63. We don't need to go back and do all that again. But what I added is that I'm, I'm thinking more and more carefully about these metamorphic rims surrounding these old PCers from Idaho, those detrital zircons. I'm thinking more and more about these metamorphic rims that are younger than 100 million years ago that have high-grade signatures as potentially being from the CPC. And if you caught it from yesterday's show, Margie thought that she had some bedrock up in the Canadian CPC that was metasedimentary, and had the high-grade nature, and had the right ages that potentially were the source of that material. 
again, cheating because I ran out of chalkboard space, but I showed this very quickly yesterday. I'm, I'm thinking about the CPC, whether it's the insular block or not, as being surrounded by and also partly within a bunch of metasedimentary material. And, and, and so Margie is wondering about the potential source of the metasedimentary material with the CPC. And today's show is that metasedimentary material in the North Cascades of Washington. Can we revisit the Swakane nice or even the Skagit nice? as having the right age of metamorphism, and maybe as important or maybe more important, when exactly, Bob, did that crystalline core get up to the surface where we can start eroding some of that metasedimentary rock? And that's important, obviously, because potentially that's going to the Nanaimo. I did get caught and misspoke yesterday. What's the right phrase there? And Margie reminded me that to this day, they still have not found any detrital PC grains in the Coast Mountains batholith. And therefore, she was pretty strong about, did, about uh, thinking that those magmatic rims in the Nanaimo were not coming from the CPC. If that's the case, where the hell did it come from? Are we back to the Idaho batholith as a source? Or are there other plutons that are between 172 million years ago, somewhere along the western margin, that owe their origin, or that, that are contributing uh, to those grains. Oh my God, that, that's plenty. Bob, before I come to you, I just want a few things on the laptop, and then I promise we're coming. So, nicksetner.com, secure, click on Baja in the upper right-hand corner. That gets you to three papers for today. Bob Miller, our guest, has had a flurry of brand new papers. I picked this one, Bob, where we're linking deep and shallow crustal processes in the North Cascades. And here Bob is, is uh, showing us the Straight Creek Fault and the Ross Lake Fault Zone and the Pesaton and the Entiat Fault, all noticeably truncating at the Fraser River Fault. And then here those things are popping out on the other side. Plenty more for you to enjoy in that paper. I also chose two more papers. This coming from a Sandra Wild Paul Umhofer paper that always comes up. Everybody talks about this thing and how important that paper is. I'm going to use it in just a bit, but going to the other camera, I want to let you know. that some of the holiday break, I'm going to be cracking this bad boy open. And the wild Umhofer paper is in this. But I haven't done much reading yet in this, and there's plenty of paleomag in here as well. But if you don't know about this special paper, um, it's required reading, I think. Back to the laptop, don't get distracted. Don't get distracted. Bob and Paul Umhofer uh, did a paper back uh, 25 years ago uh, restoring much of the Straight Creek Fault to get us thinking about continuing the CPC down into the North Cascades. And that's, of course, where we're going today. But, but we, before we do, let's just do a few little photos before we go to Bob. Yeah, we're close to home now. North Cascades. Yeah, we're using backcountry Gary photos with the Holy Trinity here of the Windy Pass thrust that is uh, taking Ingalls and shoving it up on top of Chewakam, and then the whole thing's cut by the Mount Stewart Batholith. Yeah, this is Bob Miller, our guest today, and Stacia Gordon will be our guest in the next show. Going back up to BC, um, Margie as I was starting to live stream yesterday, emailed me a few photos. I want to share those with you. So we're going back up to the uh, Coast Plutonic Complex and the shear zone within it. And Margie just wanted to share some photos of her and Robinson and others doing some field work up in the CPC. Here's Robinson uh, all roped up, crossing some crevasses. 
Here's Robinson and some metasedimentary rock as well as some plutonic rock. And you can get a sense of the scale of this place, possibly near Mount Waddington, but I don't really know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And you, you heard Margie's comment uh, from late yesterday that there is some field geology that involves that kind of crazy, wild adventures. And Bob Miller, age 71, is on the trails with everybody else and just pushing himself physically. But you heard Margie say that if that's not your scene, there's still plenty of great research opportunities and just a place for you in geology. It doesn't all have to be out there doing all that field work. Many of us enjoy that, but it, it's not a requirement for being a major contributor to a lot of this geologic discussion. Um, I happened, I couldn't find it before Margie's show, but I finally found a diagram that I like from Kathy Connor's Roadside Book of Alaska. I like this one where she has the Denali Fault. This didn't come up yesterday, but the Denali Fault, which is still active, down past Juneau, looking like it's merging into the Coast Shear Zone. Like, what do I do with that? It was clear from Margie that the Coast Shear Zone has not had any offset in the last 40 million years at least. But the Denali is still active. So is that, I don't know what to do there. But the Coast Shear Zone is, is continuing down towards the southern CPC. But before we do that here, I love these simplified maps from Kathy, the Roadside Geology of Alaska, showing the significance of the Coast Shear Zone. I mean, I don't know, Bob, is there a Coast Shear Zone equivalent in the North Cascades? I think Margie pretty carefully said she now sees the Coast Shear Zone all the way through the CPC. If that's true, and if we like the North Cascades as being part of the CPC, I don't know. Can we follow the, that Shear Zone all the way through? Is it the, North, is it the Ross Lake thing? There's the dream team. We're about to visit with Bob. Station next time, I'll rope Mike Eddy into this, probably February, I'm guessing. More backcountry Gary, look at this, putting in flags on the border. More backcountry uh, Gary photos, looking at the Ross Lake Fault Zone, which I probably will come up in our discussion today as a potential major offset fault. Farther close to, uh, cl closer to home, Ellensburg's just over the horizon looking at the Leavenworth Fault, looking at the Eniot Fault, how many kilometers of offset on those guys. Backcountry Lindsay showing us some of this beautiful Ingalls serpentinite in the North Cascades. It's 9.30, Bob. I'm coming to you in three minutes. Backcountry Lindsay also doing some intense hiking, showing us the Ingalls, the Chewakum, and Mount Stewart. And then, yeah, we're, we're going to get into each of these faults a little bit. I'll show up. I'll, I'll maybe hold up the, the Mappy McMap uh, on my side of the camera, Bob, if you want to talk about some individual faults where we have known offsets. These are all from Bob Miller's work. CPC on one side, North Cascades on the other. Why can't we link those together? Especially if we restore the Street Creek Fault. Here's Seattle. And so the CPC is right next door if we get rid of the 100 plus kilometers of offset on the Straight Creek Fault. Here's Bob now with recent work helping us see that you can shut off one of the strike slip faults because we don't have offset of some of these Eocene plutons and we kill that and then we start up offset on another fault. So nobody's saying that these strike slip faults all have to be active at the same time, even if they're sub parallel to each other. I'll finish with this, and that is that the wild Umhofer paper did an incredible job of closing the Columbia embayment and getting these rocks that are in northern Washington and B.C. today, let me skip that, and getting these rocks in the north and restoring them using known strike-slip faults Back to 100 million years ago, we can get the Klamath and Central Washington geology right next door. Here's the money shot. Here's the Klamath of southwestern Oregon. And here's the Ingalls of the Josephine Ophiolite. And they're right next door to each other if we take out all of these known faults. So it's impossible, says this paper, it's impossible to be a one 
on the scale of one to 10, because we have known strike slip faults that have known offsets on them. And so you at least have to get these exotic terrains down into Oregon if you are really looking carefully at those faults. Bob Miller, it's time for you. Hope you're up for this, particularly wild this morning, but let's go for it. Let me get my headphones. Tripping over whale parts as I go. Battery 100%. Connected to Big Lappy, that's good. Let's hope to find Bob Miller in San Jose, California. Good morning, Bob Miller. Hey, how are you doing, Nick? I'm doing great, and yourself? Oh uh, well, thank you. Uh, shouldn't have had that margarita. Shouldn't have had that margarita last night, I guess, <laughs> or, uh, before the wine. But I, I think I'm awake. <laughs> Good stuff from you right off the bat. I love it. Uh, hey, you know what? Let's get into this by talking about the trip that you just got back from. Where did you go, and and why did you go down there? Oh, I was down in uh, Patagonia and uh, Chile uh, and and. The main thing was Torres del Paine, which is a you know famous uh, World Heritage or UNESCO site. It's like the wildest place I've ever been in terms of glaciers and and that sort of thing. It was great. It was hard. We did an eight day backpack, uh, so called O, where you go around the mountain and um, yeah. So we did about eighty miles in eight days and. Uh, it was uh, with some the winds are ferocious there, and that was cool. But I've, I've always wanted to go well, not always, uh, but for many, many years, I've wanted to go there. And I think I, I mentioned to you that actually, probably it was an earlier trip, is why I know Mike Eddie so well, and we wouldn't have gotten together otherwise. Was uh, probably was I uh, wanted to go on a field, I've always wanted to go to Patagonia. There was a meeting in Mendoza. Argentina called Backbone of the Americas, the Geologic Society of America put on. And as part of that, there was a field trip um, in Argentina uh, that started way south. And we went about 800 kilometers to the north and then crossed over to Chile. But what, what drove the science there was the idea of what's happening when you subduct a ridge. And the best example in the world is in Chile where it's happening now. And so this was about, I think that was 2006 and Daryl Callen had his 2003 paper dealing with this, uh, Madsen um, from uh, Simon Fraser. She had a great, great paper about the talks were coming on. So I was interested in it. And then we ended up writing a proposal a few years later, which, which funded Mike's research with, wrote it with Mike colleague and, and friend, Sam Bowering. So uh, anyway, so that, that was the yeah. impetus for going there. It turned out, turned out well. And I, I'm, I kind of forced a narrative on you a couple of shows ago, like, oh, that must be like some sort of retirement trip, like you're finally done yeah. teaching, but you've got, you've got one more semester? Yeah, we have a, an early retirement program where you teach uh, one semester a year, and you can do it for five years. And mm. you're, Like I was teasing you. You're like the third person who's thought I was retired. So I'm getting a little worried that maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe it's time to go, but uh, no, no, it's not. It's not, but well, I'm not going to retire from research and, and uh, yes, supervise. I still have a couple of three students left that I'm supervising one working mm -hmm. in the Skagit nice near Stahican. So, uh, well, let's, let's get into it. This is just so great. So I, I guess my first thought is, you did your PhD, University of Washington. You're catching this time where Peter Mish is leaving. He's basically a one on the scale of one to 10, as far as fixes versus mobilist. And, and now Daryl Cowan's showing up and he's pretty high on this scale. Um, have you kind of actively been working with both of those groups, people that are all over the place on this Baja BC scale, just generally? I would say so, although, um, to be fair to Peter, he was the first one to suggest large strike slip on the Straight Creek Fault. Uh, okay. Because he recognized, uh, Peter had a, a student 
uh, named Brian Lowe's, who was working in Canada. He was, I think he's retired, but he was a Pacific Lutheran professor yeah. in Tacoma. Yeah. And there was a fellow, Carlos Plummer, who worked on the Chihuahuam Schist. You probably uh, may, may know that name, who yeah. uh, was working at about the same time. And Mish noticed, gee, the Chihuahuam Schist and the Settler Schist look a lot alike, and they have the same metamorphic history. And then about the same time, Joe Vance, another professor, well, a little earlier, at the mm -hmm. uh, University of Washington when I was there, Joe and his PhD area near Darrington, Washington, recognized, he was the first to recognize the Straight Creek Fault. Uh, oh. Straight Creek is somewhere there. I've been there, but it's just some logging road near Darrington. Oh. So anyway, uh, Mish moved things around. Daryl came, I think, my second year. Yep, yep. Keep and going. Anyway, Daryl was uh, Daryl was really thinking a lot about melanges then, and 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 mobilistic. But yeah, I think we've all all worked with these various things, and certainly uh, different groups. But it's it's cool to see how it's all evolved through time. Yes. So, um, how much offset do you like on the Straight Creek Fault? We're looking at it right here. This major fault coming through here with these known units on the east versus the west. I, I I'm come around to accepting sort of uh, the 150 kilometers. That's the most recent estimate that. Jim yep. Monger and Ned Brown had, and you can yep. vary it a little bit uh, one way or another. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm moving more towards the larger displacement rather than 90, which is the okay. minimum one that, that Roland Tabor had proposed at, uh, at one time. Good. So I don't think there's any question, and it's just to get, just to emphasize what you said, when you do that 150 kilometers or 160, which is what Paul Umhofer and I used, you, you got to, and the North Cascades are just right next to the Coast Plutonic Complex, the Coast Mountains Basilisk, to use Margie and Robinson's terms. So I, I don't think there's any question in my mind that they're they're the same. The North Cascades are just the southernmost extension, uh, but they have a lot more. There's a lot more metamorphic rocks left in the North Cascades than uh, in the Coast Plutonic Complex to the northwest, and that's why I think we can work out more of the metamorphic history because we have lots of plutons, but we also have lots of metamorphic rocks. And if you go farther north, you go, uh, as Margie, I think Margie said that there's just not a lot of host rock for parts of parts of the stalgorinitic rock. So is that, so you got together with Margie this summer just to, to go back and forth about potentially this issue right here. And is she more hesitant than you about bringing the CPC through to the North Cascades, and is it because they just don't have enough metamorphic rock to, to make matches? I, I don't think so in that sense. I think one of the key issues, and we've tried to address that in this manuscript, I think I sent you that took forever to finally yeah. get submitted, but uh, there, are, there are these age differences which uh, between you already pointed it out in terms of the flare-ups and yeah. so the southernmost but the southernmost coast mountains batholith east of vancouver uh there aren't a lot of the younger it, there aren't a lot of younger plutons it's more in the 90s mm. uh the 91 96 and it isn't it isn't till you get more uh to bella coola which i think margie and uh robinson would call the central uh, Coast Mountains Batholith, that you start seeing these big differences in ages. So we've actually used this in terms of thinking about uh, when you restore the Fraser and some fault and some of the other things, how do these age belts match up? And uh, so I think that's some of the issues that we haven't, you know, we, we hope to explore more. Uh, and part of it, uh, Paul, uh, Paul and Mike and and I and Jeff Tepper have sort of suggested maybe there was a flat slab and the edge of the flat slab uh, kind of corresponds, the flat slab beneath the North Cascades from 60 to 50 million to explain why we don't have magmatism. And mm -hmm. then the edge of that slab uh, would restore just south of where Margie and Rob, where Robinson have all these uh, ages that 
don't seem to match up with our law. Yeah. yeah. So I'm well, um, about maps. <laughs> it is, but I, I think this will work. Um, let's let's try this. So going all the way back 25 years to you and Paul writing that paper about restoring uh, Fraser fault and ultimately getting to restoring a bunch of those thrust vaults, right. is it is the general chronology a major contraction between 185 million years ago to make all those thrust vaults and then you just start breaking them apart with strike slip action? Is that the general chronology thrust vaults versus strike slip faults in the North Cascades? Yes, yes. Uh, no, okay. no question about it in my mind. And, you know, the real question, and Margie touched on this yesterday, is when did those strike slip faults start? And yes. That's, that's, we can get them back, at least in Washington and I think in southern British Columbia, you can get them back to 65 million. Okay. But before that, it's, it's, it's the big question, when do faults initiate? And she touched on that yesterday as well. And so we, we have a gap there, but uh, certainly the contraction continues to 90, 85 million, the thrusting, folding, and then uh, strike slip 65, and we think probably earlier, but, uh, yeah. or at least some transpression, but it's hard to, hard to document that. So let's just use the, 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 the black teeth guys first, which are our thrust faults. So do you like the hosamine and the yalicum being the same thrust fault? Uh, or strike slip faults, really, in, in terms of... Oh, there are? Okay. Yeah, hosamine has, well, a lot of fault zones get reactivated, but yalicum oh, would be yeah. primarily, yalicum yeah. definitely strikes slip. And then the hosamine, uh, which is in British Columbia, and in, and we call it in northern Washington, uh, and it, it, def it has more suggestion for thrusting. It partly depends how you interpret. It's a complicated question and, and actually Mike and Station and I are planning to uh, go up and look at the, the fault again, the Jack Mountain fault this summer. Um, okay, that's, that's coming so back. So there's questions, yeah. but, but I'd say argument, I mean, the hosamine is so long. When you put the hosamine and yalicum together, they're hundreds, many hundreds of kilometers in length. And uh, then the question, if you look at faults around the world, there are long thrust faults, but generally not so relatively linear and go for perhaps up to 500 kilometers along strikes. So we're not talking, you know, baby, baby faults when you put the hosamine and yalicum together. And really it's that whole system of faults on the east side of the Cascades core, the Ross Lake, uh, the hosamine, et cetera, yeah. put together. Yeah. So, um, just as we're looking at this map right here, especially on the east side, which which of these faults are you feeling uh, have, can you give us just off the top of your head, known offsets of each of these faults to this point? Well, I would say if you look at how the hosamine comes down into the Ross Lake, if you yes. consider that as a system and then down to the Foggy Dew Fault, which is okay. uh, essentially this a big fault within that zone. We okay. estimate at least 115 kilometers of strike slip. That's okay. 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 And then you come uh, west from there. Uh, the Entiat Fault, which in many ways is the most enigmatic uh, to us. Uh, the Enead has at least 30, probably 40 kilometers of dextral slip that you can do document. The reason it's important is the thermal history, which maybe bears on your Nanaimo question and, ex and when okay. things were up. Uh, yeah. that, that's a big structure, but the main evidence for it is uh, where we, we see it best or think about it the most is in the south where, where Aaron Donahue did her master's yeah. thesis in the, in the Chumstick Basin. But the problem there is, again, it cuts sediments as young as 46 million, but it continues up where it's just cutting metamorphic rocks. And we don't really, it's hard to say again when it started, but
but it has it seems to be a big break and then you have the leavenworth fault which probably has yeah. about 30 kilometers when you showed that picture so you put yeah. that together and with the fraser i think our calculations were 335 kilometers of right lateral strike slip we felt like so you know if you hadn't screwed up all that whale you could have sliced it up with a nice knife and made yeah. it uh, and that would be after you know a lot of these things are happening right so that would have been the last bit of it would be to slice it up a little more coherently so you could butter it <laughs> i love it thank you for playing with that um are you holding out any thoughts that it's how do i say this without pigeonholing you here is it possible the north uh, the, the ross lake fault zone or the Pesaten has more than a thousand kilometers of offset on it is it possible well i mean and i guess it's possible for the Pesaten, but there's surely it's very very difficult <laughs> i would say yeah. exceedingly difficult partly uh the Pesaten, and i thought about this yesterday uh, when you were talking about the left lateral strike slip, the Pesaten really yeah. has well-documented sinistral slip on it. And this it was, oh. yeah, this was, well, early, this is from about 110 to 105 million years, which is okay. the sweet spot, right? That was what Yang and Wang and, and Gerald's, et cetera, and, and Knapp talked about farther yeah. west. But instead of being in the western part of the Coast Mountains Batholith, uh, Coast CPC that that uh, Margie was talking about, and they were talking about, you know, we're way inboard, right, with the Satan. Yes. And right. so the Besatan, uh, it's, it's, uh, there was a fellow, Hugh Herlow, who is one of Daryl's students in the late 1980s, maybe the early 90s, who worked up um, near the Canadian border in, in Washington. And uh, he showed some of the problems with not being able to trace the host of the the Satan fault to the south, but to the north in southern British Columbia, uh, Charlie Gregg and uh, uh, did a his master's thesis and papers from UBC from British Columbia University of British Columbia, and I've had a couple of students. It's pretty clear left lateral ductal left lateral strike slip. So that part of the North Cascades moving south with that fault or other faults that. That's certainly real. Now, the big question is, after 105, that doesn't mean you couldn't have brittle slip on the Pesaten, brittle dextral slip. That, that's still possible. It just gets problematic at the south end, down where uh, your your colleague upstairs is working, where Chris, Chris is <laughs> yeah. working. It gets really hard to move it through, and nobody's been able to find it all the way to the Columbia River basalts. But there is some suggestion. There's some sediments um, near sort of the east, just east of Winthrop and Twist, for those of you who know Washington geography, uh, that are about, uh, they're probably about 70 million years old and they're just isolated right on the fault. So they're just right there and we don't really have any sediments of that age. There's a big gap in sediments between. Uh, about 85, 90 million years in the Cascades until we get to the Swalk Formation, mm. which mm. maybe gets in chumps in Chuckanut, which get back yeah. near the 60. So it's interesting. We have these really isolated, maybe 30 square kilometers of rock called the Pipestone Canyon Formation that, um, you know, is along the fall. And that certainly suggests it's a fault-related system. And Mike's day, Mike Eddy has dated a, a sample that we just, we collected one morning. We had a couple hours to kill. And, uh, you know, there's some some suggestion of 78 million year class in that, which 78 million is more like the you know, North Cascades than a mm. Okanagan age to the east. So, you know, right. that could be there's there's little hints, but nothing very strong. Nothing. Uh, but the sinistral is pretty clear. There's in our recent work or my students and mine, it's it's. it's I think we've refined, but it's not changing what um, was done in the early 1990s on the Pesaten. This is this is excellent. This is just what I was hoping for this morning, Bob. And are you going to say something similar about the Ross Lake Fault Zone as far as you doubt 
more than a thousand well, kilometers? I, I, guess, I guess the thing with the Ross Lake, and this comes down to the paleo mag. So it seems like okay. you need to, you, you can't pick and choose the paleo mag you like, right? So right. the metal basin, there are there is paleo mag data from the metal that um, I think it was, um, well, I can't remember the exact publication, but it summarized like an Enkin and I think uh, yep. basal, basal Tickoff's uh, hit and run paper, he talks about it. Uh, yeah. And it was remagnetized, so probably around 80 million years. So it's a little more complicated, but it certainly seems to be part of uh, a Baja BC block. So in that context, that would put the Ross Lake, Hosamine, Foggy Dew, et cetera, that would put it in the, again, whether you want to call it insular or right. transported block with using Margie's terminology, the, the material that got moved a lot. And that would be, yeah. so the Ross Lake, probably wouldn't be the big driver there for that. that huh. So just, just generally then, oh, that's really interesting. So are you starting to wonder about a major fault or a few major faults completely to the east of the North Cascades? No, it seems like that's where you'd have to put it. And that's where I... I'm ignorant, so it's easier to put things in where you're more or less ignorant <laughs> uh, of things. Yeah. Uh, there, there's some. Um, uh, there's a shear zone uh, that. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a couple shear zones on the right. east side of uh, uh, that involve Quinellia, which you know the terrain to the east of of the Pasayan Fault. There are some shear zones, although the ones that we've looked at mostly have reverse slip for the latest motion. And again, as I said, faults can change motion. Well, obviously we talked about left lateral, left, more commonly going from uh, being reactivated as extensional or contractional structures, but certainly, um, you know, it's, it's, it's possible, certainly potentially uh, real. So the metal data are what always throw me a bit and, uh, okay you know, in terms yeah. of the paleo mag, because the Ross Lake zone would work. But you also have another problem, and that is, I jokingly talked to, to my friend Mike Eddy about how the Cooper Mountain Batholith is sort of like the big suck. All the faults go into it, and they oh, never yeah. come out. And uh, yeah. if you look at the southern end of the Pesaten, it kind of curves or transfers into uh, some other faults. And then one of my students, Will Hopkins, who I I think was watching. Uh, I saw yeah, him. Right yeah, he uh, he. That was his master's thesis, partly there, and and uh, and Frank Raviola, who also watches. His, that was his main assignment was to find the Ross Lake fault zone south of the Cooper Mountain, yeah. and it's hard to do it. And that's what Chris Mattinson and I think uh, would agree, and Erin Shea with her student. So it's it's probable. Well. Um... Yeah, the next step for us is the paleo mag and, and really, I think, trying to look at blocks that have major candidates for movement, which is real fuzzy in my brain at the moment, by the way. So that will be a new way to look at a bunch of this. But I think the last thing I want to do with you before we bring in the viewers and viewers, give me another five minutes with with Bob, just one on one, please. And then we'll come to you and we'll go anywhere you want to go. The timing of getting those meta sedimentary rocks to the surface to then potentially get eroded by rivers and send them to the Nanaimo. What's the, I'm, I'm more interested in that now because of this stuff I've been learning in the Nanaimo. So when do you get some of the Skagit or the Swakane for sure to the surface? How many years ago? Well, I think, I think again, here's where that any at fault comes up important. Okay. So the Chowakam Schist and the Mount Stewart, they both were brought to the, well, at least they were brought to shallow levels pretty quickly. The Chowakam schist was buried deeply, but the, at least the biot, argon, argon, and KAR, older KAR biotite ages, which just tell you when the rocks cool below, let's say, 300 degrees Celsius. Okay. Those, um, those ages are in the, 
in the 80, 80 millions. And so the Chewakum and certainly the could whatever was above it, those rocks were metamorphosed in the oh. mid Cretaceous. Oh, they, they would be. And if you look at um, our our fault reconstructions, that's Paul Umhofer and Mike and me and Jeff uh, Tepper, we would have Vancouver Island in a minimum right off of um, uh, we could take Vancouver Island and you restore it. It restores right just very close to the Mount Stewart region. Um, and so I would think more on that. Now, the Skagit and the Swalcan, and I, Swalcan, I'd let, I defer to uh, Kirsten Sauer who, and, and Stacia Gordon, yeah. who've done a lot of the dating, but a lot yeah. of the metamorphism there was occurring, let's say, 74 to 65 million years. So it would only be the very latest part of the history. And and the Skagit stayed buried, and then your elevator shot up like a out of control yeah. elevator around fifty million. So, uh, yeah. Too so long. I, I, if I yeah. was looking for, I would look at the Chewakum schist. And, wow. And it's got a lot, you know, and it does have a has some older zircons in it. I mean, come on, baby. I mean. I'm I'm starting to get more interested now. I it didn't even occur to me, Bob, to be honest with you, that this is a potential. Wow. Okay, that's or really exciting. Or there may be problems that I'm not thinking of, but if you're thinking right. of metamorphic rocks of that age that got uplift exhumed quickly, you know, again, whether they actually made it to the surface, I, you know, that's it's another question. Yeah. But they got at least the rocks we now see popped up pretty fast, particularly the farther south you go, the the block is tilted. So as you go up uh, to the northern part or northeastern part of the Chewakum schist, it's a bit younger. But um, I mean, yeah, the up the exhumation is a bit younger because those rocks were deeper. But certainly around the Mount Stewart region and presumably the settler schist would be uh, in, in southern BC. Uh, and in that area, you would have, again, similar similar early ages so that if i was looking for metamorphic rocks in the north cascades i'd just you know 100 kilometers from your house or whatever it is so that makes me happy i'm going to continue <laughs> thinking about that thank you that was boy that's a highlight right there at one more time you think that that chewakum schist is getting close to the surface if not at the surface by by 85 or something 85 like that. to 80 certainly yes yes because wow. okay. the, uh, the mount stewart in it cooled quickly. Now, again, you had burial, but the actual, there's a bunch of, of ages on that. Now, there's the real young history that's also been looked at, like yeah. in Icicle Canyon, where people have done uranium, thorium, helium, and various fission track dates. But, but again, even though the rocks we see now weren't, maybe weren't at the surface, you know, there could be certainly Chewakum schist higher up that's now gone. Wow. God dang. That's, th that's a thrill. That's a thrilling moment, Bob. I love that moment. Hey, viewers, we're coming to you right now. Can you type in uppercase, please? Bob, you got another 10 minutes or so oh, to sure. answer a few questions? Yeah. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate your time on a Sunday morning. I'm going to go for a walk uh, later at the beach, but not till 1 o'clock. So. Oh, my God. Rub it in. What, what's the weather there right now? Oh, it's cold. It's uh, According to my computer, it's only 40 degrees. So. All right. Uh, Cindy Carp asks, uh, can strike slip faults become thrust faults at a later stage? Yes, they can. Um, it's, it's geometrically thrust faults, of course, are generally dip uh, moderately to shallowly, but you can get steep reverse faults that do it. And we've, we've uh, Paul and I, uh, Umhofer and I, toyed around with the idea there's a structure called the White River Shear Zone that occurs um, southwest of the, between the Eniat Fault and the Mount Stewart Bathless that bounds the oceanic rocks, so-called Nepequa schist, and puts them on top of Chewakum schist. And when we match that up with some of our, uh, some of our faults in British Columbia, it's possible it had early strike slip, but uh, it can happen probably a little more difficult than say taking 
and older, with lots of examples where older normal faults get reactivated as thrust and, and vice versa because they don't dip as steeply as strike slip. Thank you. Um, David asks, why is there so much more metamorphic rock in the North Cascades compared to the Canadian CPC? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so Jim Monger noted back in the 1980s that when you restore the faults, uh, the Fraser fault, and you kind of match up the rocks on the southeast, they tend to be a little higher temperature. Uh, the rocks in the Washington side and in southern British Columbia, but, uh, there is Skagit Nice up near Hope, British Columbia, uh, just across the border. Uh, when you match those up, uh, it seems like the rocks are higher grade. And he's matching up to Ridge River and Apequa, to use the parochial names. And so that would argue that maybe we have met more metamorphic rocks at depth, which is kind of counterintuitive to what a lot of models for plutons, where we think, okay, the plutons, the deep crust is all plutonic, and the shallow crust is more sediment or volcanics, but that that seems to be an observation that I agree with. There's a structural, it's it's as if when the the Fraser Strait Creek, it had the strike slip dominant, but it might have had a small component of bringing up the Washington side so that we see a little deeper levels. Hmm. Hmm. Let's keep it going. Or well, you can also argue yeah. this is the end of the batholith, you know, that the batholith yeah. It's just dying out to the southeast. Right, right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Will Bradley, is Will one of your former students? Is that, who, is that the Will we're talking about? Will Bradley? No. No, no, Will Hopkins. Okay, okay. Will Bradley wonders, could the melange belt be a manifestation of the coast shear zone now eroded to the surface? You know, I, I, uh, I have a, in a, we, we, when we do our reconstructions and we take Margie's uh, where she's mapped the coast shear zone, but she also has at uh, least, uh, you know, hasn't, hasn't published it. But when she draws it, I think she calls it the scar shear zone or something. Scar Creek, you could ask her. I'm sure she could correct yeah. me if I said it wrong. <laughs> but it goes even farther southeast. But when we do our reconstructions, then we find the coast shear zone is is would be to the west of the cascades core so that yeah. would put it down through the melange belts and i don't want to put put words in daryl's mouth but i forget why daryl callan why he didn't having a beer at least or a glass of wine he didn't seem to like that but uh, i don't remember the details of the arguments but in our reconstruction that's that's, that's where, where we put the kosher zone would be hmm propagating somewhere west of the Strait Creek Fault. So that's a great question. Okay. Sven wonders, I don't know if you saw these shows, Bob, but back in the Nanaimo shows, I was talking about these, I had this phrase, the old PCers, which are right. these old detrital Precambrian grains. Sven wonders, are there any of those old Precambrian detrital zircons in any of the schists or even the Mount Stewart Pluton? Well, not in the Pluton. The Plutons, yeah. I think, like Robinson said, that they, um, you don't see like the Idaho Batholith where these cores, uh, at least to my knowledge. Uh, there, are, there is some Precambrian, certainly in this volcano. And, and you know, I think I'd leave that to Kirsten. I don't want to, yeah. Kirsten's going to be on that. I mean, she's the one who, uh, well, we've known that for a while, a long while. That's yeah. why the volcano was always kind of a puzzle. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we've. I, I think there, there certainly is some Precambrian, yes, and that's a big, that's a big component of the Mojave BC model is in terms wow. of how you interpret those Lemahe arch zircons and right. the stuff that you've talked about you know, that the Nanaimo folks talk about a lot, Brian Mahoney, <laughs> and et cetera. How about in that Chihuacan schist? Does anybody look for old Precambrian detrital in the Chihuacan? Yes, I think there is a little bit. Yes, there is. Yeah, very little of the Chihuacan data, as far as I know, is published. Uh, but really? 
Uh, yeah, well, Ned Brown has, a, just Ned Brown did a couple samples with George Garrell's lab, and I think it's a little bit of that, and my my colleague from the 1990s, who I did a lot of work with, Scott Patterson, also has unpublished ages, but, you know, it's unpublished. So, yes, I think there is some, but I think the Chalakum, yeah, it was fertile for a lot more work. And, uh, wow. And great target. Plus, it's easy to get to, and it's nice hiking. Yes, totally. Uh, John Nash, Spreading Ridge John Nash, wonders, uh, Bob, what caused the Ingalls and the Josephine Ophiolite to separate? I think that would have to, again, be, uh, you'd have, that that would be following Sandra Wild and Paul Hoffer and Jim Wright. You just, you restore those strike slip faults. That's, that's what you'd put them down. It would be the later strike slip faulting. Um, and, and I think that's an argument people made comparisons. Uh, Ned, Ned Brown certainly has amongst others from the San Juan Islands geology uh, the similarities to things in the Klamis. So, uh, and Daryl has too. So, uh, yeah. So I think it would be the strike slip faults that, that, that uh, even though we can't place our hand necessarily on a single one, because we've got all those bloody cascade, Cenozoic right. cascade volcanic rocks in the way. Right. Well, John probably wants to get at a tectonic reason that's driving the strike slip faulting, but we don't we don't need to go there necessarily. But uh, it's it it, it is kind of interesting when things when the waves part basically it, it, to create that Columbian embayment. I don't know. I do remember you mentioning at one point you might get more interested in the rim rock inlier again. Uh, yeah. You know, because we're kind of heading into this never never land. It seems between these exotic terrains we know up here and down there. Are you still thinking about that? Rim well, rock I, the Rimrock Lake. I you know I did that work. Yeah. Not, yeah I, I, well, I remember I first was going to work on it in 1980, and then this volcano erupted and uh, <laughs> kind of covered covered the rocks with a bunch of ash. Uh, yeah. that. So I started the year after Mount St. Helens, working on that, but. Um, yeah, I was interested in it because it's just like the only piece of Mesozoic out there, and there are there are fossil ages, and we know it's we we, we know kind of where it is, and uh, it would be really nice to have a detrital zircon study on it. I think it's pretty important. Um, there are new models. Uh, Basil tries to account for part of the Columbia embayment with his uh, rotations. That maybe you'll talk about more with him is his clockwise rotation kind of rotating blocks in the east. But there's some other ideas that uh, Paul and um, Gene Humphreys and, and me to a lesser extent were, were chatting about where uh, Gene likes to compare it with the California borderlands down like Catalina Island, those islands off of Southern California where it looks like they're just sort of being stripped by the San Andreas and little chunks left behind. Yeah. Maybe a little bit like your bread model. So there, are, there's some idea that the terrains move northwards, little pieces get left, like the rim rock. So yeah, I think it. I think it'd be good for somebody to go in with a new set of tools uh, to look at least at the sedimentary rocks. And right. yeah, long-winded answer. Sorry. Very good. Nope, doing great. How about three more, Bob? Uh, Backcountry Lindsay Malone asks: Did the North Cascades CPC specifically Mount Stewart, Black Peak, Ten Peak, Cheval, did they all exhume about the same time? No, no, not all of that. The Black, well, uh, that's, that's an interesting question. I would say that the Ten Peak exhumed a little bit younger than the Mount Stewart. So Mount Stewart and Black Peak, uh, for those, just to review a couple of things about them, they're both pretty shallow. They're both very large bodies. One eats Mount Stewart on the south end of the Cap Crystal and Core, Black Peak on the northeast. It also intrudes the Metal, so it uh, basin. So it's pretty shallow, and so those probably got exhumed. Well, we know the Mount Stewart got exhumed earlier. Black Peak's more complicated. Ten Peak was deeper, so. Uh, we had a model, Scott Patterson and I, we called it the North Cascades Crustal Section. 
And, in, and we used the stuff west of the Ennead Fault to argue that it was complicated. It wasn't a simple tilt, but 10 peak was much deeper. 10 peak pluton intruded between probably 25 to 35 kilometers depth, probably more like 30. And Mount Stewart was more likely intruded at 10 kilometers depth. So it would have just taken a lot longer for the 10 peak to make it to the surface in any context. Mm -hmm. Okay, how about one more, Bob? This is mine. Okay. Uh, have you ever worked with PaleoMag data sets in any of your publications? And if you haven't, do you see the PaleoMag as being a totally different data set that's very difficult to merge with well, the work you've been doing? I guess maybe maybe you were talking about reeling it in. Uh, you know, it's more like like accepting it or or not, but not dealing with it too much. Uh, I think the the dikes actually, uh, in part, prodding from reviewers and this dike paper that we published earlier this year. Yeah. You know, and and got Merle a uh, series of emails with Merle Beck excited uh, was the Tianaway basalts and looking and thinking more about rotations. And we know there's a lot of rotations to the south uh, in the southern, certainly in the west to the west in, in Western Oregon going up towards the Olympics, but decreasing northwards. <coughs> and, and as well as parts of the Oregon, cast, Southern Oregon Cascades. And so one of the, one of the things we've been, been thinking about and Merle was hoping to get a student, well, he was hoping to talk Bernie into getting a student, I think. Uh, was uh, housing was looking more at these dikes because we know their age is pretty well thanks to Mike's Mike Eddy's dates and we know their orientations and it'll be interesting to see if those but that's a different kind of rotation that's a vertical axis rotation like huh. spinning a top versus yeah. the Baja BC paleo mag huh. So in that sense, the paleo mag is interesting to you but that's really at the tail end of this Baja BC movement right Yeah. Oh, definitely. And some yeah. would argue later, later than okay. that. Yeah. yeah. If uh, I could add one last thing, I was thinking about hey, things where, that, and that I I'm, hopefully will get to uh, Chris Mattinson about, see if you can get to yeah. him. So Good. we talked a lot about arcs and arcs migrating, or not we, but you and, and Robinson and, and, and Margie and others. But one of the things that most people don't think about a lot, and this is where the Pusatan Fault Zone, well, I, mean, I shouldn't say they don't, but it's not widely brought up in the literature, is when you look at the North Cascades and you say, well, it only has 96 million for the oldest arc plutons, so younger than, than the Coast Mountains. But people tend to ignore the fact that the Okanagan Range Baffleth is just right to the east. And it goes, if, uh, maybe there's some, I think I've got the dates pretty accurately, but Chris could, yeah. Chris could fill you in. But it's 114 to 107. Okay. So, you know, so the difference is instead of the typical migration, and we see it in the, we see it, if you look at the 78 to 60 million year Plutons, they're mostly in the uh, northeastern part of the Cascades core. They're northeast of the NEF Fault. But of course, this would be the opposite. We'd have the older, the older plutons, the Okanagan Range Batholith, to the east, and then we'd have that jump outboard. But that comes up yeah. the whole big question was, and this gets at you know, the transported terrains. Where was the Okanagan Range Batholith relative? I mean, was were the North Cascades? 1,500 kilometers south of the Okanagan Range Bathless. So talking about migration of magmatism, yeah, kind of silly in that context, or thinking of it in a, a two, well, one-dimensional almost uh, sense. So anyway, that's, that's right. I just wanted to bring that up because I don't think that has been, was raised in the last few talks. But, but again, uh, rather than getting a whole lot of ideas, I'd, I'd rather have you ask, Chris Mattinson thinks about that and put him on the spot. Uh, I, I'm sure he'd be up for it. And I oh, think I know that, it would. that's a fun part of it that, you know, these enigmas keep popping up. The Swakane Nuss, of course, has been an enigma forever. Why aren't there any plutons cutting through it? Mm -hmm. Blah, blah, blah. But 
yeah, if we're talking about enigmas, how about this this bath that you're just mentioning and that Chelan that's apparently feeding it and right across the Spisatan Fault and the whole thing. So, yeah, we will definitely dig in deeply with Chris about that. Well, and that's why, because it seems to occur across south of the Cooper Mountain Bathleth, that's why we played around with models of the of the strike slip of the Ross Lake Fault stepping over to the southern Eniac Fault Zone. Yeah, yeah. got to get around it somehow. And, yeah, yeah uh, it's, a, it's a problem. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> just thought hey, I'd throw that in. Thank you. Well, I want you to uh, enjoy your walk on the beach, Bob. Soak in all that 40-degree weather and come back and watch the replay, and you can see all these amazing comments, and everybody's just, I'm sure, thanking you for all your time. So, again, thank you, as always, for helping out okay. here, and sure. we'll look for you this summer out in the field. How about that, right, Bob? Be good, be good to get together. Okay. Okay. All right. Bye -bye. Well, thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That was Dr. Bob Miller from San Jose State University in the San Francisco Bay Area. Always enjoy chatting with him. Easy to talk to. Incredible depth of knowledge. And like most of our guests, he's able to see what we're trying to do here. And he tailors the discussion for all of us so that we can follow the best we can. I think I want to go to the laptop and just do some, I've kind of been doing that lately, just going to the laptop and just doing some uh, mopping up, basically. And... Uh, if you're confused about the uh, pieces of bread, let me clue you in if you joined us midway through. Starting with the basil show, we were talking about the concept of a whale, the insular block, a whale, a Baja BC block, a whale migrating up the coast, just like the whales do from Mexico to Alaska. And then in the last show, I started thinking about the whale going south before going north. And apparently it's most of the paleomagnetic evidence that says that, especially with Randy Inken, who we'll be visiting with in mid-January. So thanks once again to Vinman's Bakery. You've got to love it. To the laptop we go for a few final thoughts, and then we're going to say goodbye to each other until Wednesday afternoon. Emojis galore, good Lord. I think I want to slow down and look a little bit more carefully at the maps from the Sandra Wild and Paul Umhofer paper, if you don't mind. And we didn't, we didn't kind of lean into it very heavily but here's not only the Klamath Mountains in southwestern Oregon, but does that exotic terrain bedrock continues down here into Northern California. I still don't really understand if everyone is seeing these exotic terrains down here as insular or intermontane. And again, thinking of Margie's comments, I don't know how much paleomag has been done down here or how much paleomag has been done in here. I think Bernie Hausen has done some recent work with some colleagues. But look at this no man's land, mostly because of the flood basalts of the Columbia River basalt scene, 16 million years old. So another way to view that then is understanding that this in Columbia embayment is a chasm in our knowledge and our whale is doing all sorts of swimming back and forth. So like, does anybody think there was an embayment during Baja BC time? I don't think so. Especially because when you do this kind of work way back in the mid Cretaceous, you know, uh, either before, during, or after a hundred million years ago, the geography is different. The paleo geography is different. We got to get rid of this basin and range, which is a young story. And so 
to do that, we get rid of some of those young um, developments, get back to an older time. And this is still from the Sandra Wild and Paul Umhofer paper where they're going all the way up to Alaska. And they're taking each of those major strike slip faults. Most of them I don't even recognize. I don't even know how to read them or pronounce them. Tintina will come up in January for sure. The Denali, I guess. But they're, they're working with piercing points that exist on some of these known strike slip faults up in Alaska in northern BC and the Yukon. And getting those blocks back to where they belong. Now we're getting into the North Cascades. We touched briefly on the Ross Lake and the Hosamine. Now we're getting a block further south. Again, this is the whale we're talking about. Documenting the um, whale and getting the whale. This is not saying that this is sinistral now. This is just saying let's take the known dextral strike slip faults and can we restore those faults, please, and get these blocks further south. All of that is to say then, so this is, I think, very interesting. Can I enlarge this? Come on. I guess I can't. Can I enlarge this? I can't? Okay. I should be able to. I'm pinching on my little... Okay. So please notice that the basin and range has been removed now. So Nevada and Utah and Eastern California look a little funky. And we have the Klamaths basically due south of Ellensburg, as opposed to them being out here now. And so, okay, maybe I just answered my own question. I, I guess, well, I don't know if I have or not, but even if we restore this old coastline of North America during Cretaceous time, I guess we still have an embayment. But if we get those guys back to where they belong. So here's all these individual blocks. I'm still talking about the 2006 Sandra Wild Paul Umhofer paper. I hope you can see why it's, it was very important and continues to be important. And yeah, even Mahoney and Link are agreeing that, that we need to do this. We need to get these faults uh, restored and we need to get these crustal blocks back to where those exotic terrains were 100 million years ago. And if we do that, then I'm really going to slow down and show this to you. So this is by taking known strike slip faults, restoring all of them. This is what the map looks like 100 million years ago. And I'm going to be very careful. Maybe I'm going to lose some of you now, but I'm going to be very, very careful now because here's the West Melange Belt uh, in the Seattle area. Here are the San Juan Islands. Here's... Uh, Rangelia of Vancouver Island. Here's the Nanaimo. Here are some thrust faults, some pizza boxes. I.O. is the Ingalls Ophiolite, the green rocks of the Mount Stewart area. Uh, where's the Josephine? I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The Josephine or Ophiolite is in the Klamis. The Ingalls Ophiolite is in Washington. Is this a typo? Do they really want the Ingalls to be slotted in south of the Josephine? I never noticed that till right now. Is, did they have that in the other one? Okay, well, this is new to me. You're taking stuff that's now in Washington and you're slotting it in south of the stuff that is presently in southwestern Oregon. What am I missing here? Weird. Here's the Metau and the Tayotan. Here's Stikinia. Here's Cache Creek. Here's Cornelia. Here's the Blues. So I, it may be official. I, I may be done asking guests, do you think this is insular or intermontane? Again, because I have Margie Rushmore ringing in my ears. She's like, don't work with all these composite terrains that are so messy and so complicated. How about you just have a new pair of glasses on that's only looking at paleomag and approach it that way? And that's not what this is. This is just simply restoring strike-slip faults. But 
if we use those paleomag glasses, interesting thought, if we use those paleomag glasses in January, will we end up with something similar like this, using a completely different data set? To me, the highlight of today, the biggest moment of today, was Bob Miller essentially saying, uh, yeah, we have a funky uh, meta-sedimentary meta rock called the Skagit Nice that rockets to the surface in a hurry. And yes, we have a funky Swakane Nice that rockets to the surface quickly. And yes, the Swakane has old Precambrian grains in it. But Bob's like, I don't think these guys are up to the surface early enough to supply metamorphic rims to the Nanaimo. Have you thought about the Chewakam Schist as the missing metamorphic rock that has high-grade metamorphism? And I don't know if our guests on Wednesday are going to like that or not like that as they share their work. Pretty fun to follow this stuff. I got to say, a toast to you. Here's to your health, and thank you for joining us on this Sunday morning. A special thanks to you, uh, those of you who have been joining us every session live. And that's a special thanks because I've been hearing from a lot of folks saying, yeah, I, I, I believe Daryl Cowan texted me last night. He's like, I'm way behind. I can't keep up. You're doing three shows a week. And I don't want to just jump in live. I want to I want to watch them in order. So there's many who are, have interest in this series, but are three, four, five, six letters behind. And they're going to try to get caught up over Christmas. So for those that are staying on top of what we're doing and joining us live every show so that you are not behind in the alphabet, I thank you for your dedication and your enthusiasm. Here's to you. Thanks to Dr. Bob Miller, San Jose State University. What an inspiration he is. Thanks again, Bob, for your time this morning. I guess I'll show the whale one more time. So, will we keep thinking about whales migrating north and south? Probably. I'll probably take this whale home and we will enjoy it when our kids come home this week. But thank you to Vinman's Bakery for the creativity, and the willingness to be part of our series. Vindman's Bakery in beautiful downtown Ellensburg, Washington. You've got to love it. Thank you, dear viewer. I love you, and we'll see you for one more show before the holidays. One more show before the holidays. And that show will be Session L on Wednesday, December 21st at 2 p.m. Pacific time. Thank you. I love you. And goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. See you Wednesday. End stream. <laughs>